Good morning. That is actual video from the church in Corinth. <laughs> you know, the first church, the early church, fought about so many things, and they were struggling with so many things. And we forget that. I think we have this idea, and people will say, I wish we were like the, the early church. And people have said to me, I wish we were like the Acts, church in Acts. And <clears throat> you don't. You really, you really don't. They, were, they fought about crazy stuff. Last week we covered a few of the crazy things. This week, basically, both these chapters, Paul is dealing with selfishness. Now the difficulty in these chapters, and this is the struggle that I have sometimes when you're going book by book through Scripture, is this, uh, these chapters really require some background in order to, to um, help you along. So I'll be giving you some background, but, but here's kind of the big picture for you. My hope is, as we're going, because we do different kinds of studies in church. Um, a lot of times we do topical studies. There's nothing unbiblical about a topical study as long as you follow the principles of Scripture. And now we're doing a chapter-by-chapter, chapter, more of a precept study. Uh, and, and as we go chapter-by-chapter, chapter, one of the things that happens is, hopefully you're starting to understand what was going on in Corinth. You begin to kind of get a picture of what was going on, and that helps you to understand why Paul was saying some of the things that he's saying. It's this whole idea of context, understanding the context. Today, several of the passages we're going to talk about, Paul in chapter 7, and some of it to keep it PG, I skipped, and you can read it later if you want, um, uh, just like I did last week, skip part of, <laughs> part of 5. Um, but the whole idea of chapter 7, Paul sums up at the very end of the chapter. And he has some things in there that if you read them out of context, and one of them I'm going to kind of be funny about. I had a couple that has asked me to do their wedding last night, and I said, I'm going to use this in your wedding. And so when I get to that part, you're, you're going to like it. And um, anyway, and then chapter 8 is about meat sacrifice to idols, which I just, just by a show of hands, who in here this week ate some meat sacrifice to idols? Anybody? Anybody? Unless you were in Haiti, probably you, yeah, Al. You, you probably did, actually, Al. But only one person here. But other than that, most people don't deal with that. And um, so we're going to kind of talk about that and give you some context about what's going on. Today we're going to talk about building others up. And there really are only two themes in the New Testament. Loving God and loving people. That's the two themes. Now they're done a thousand different ways, but Paul really is dealing with selfishness and thinking things are about you. Yesterday, Ricky played basketball um, down at the Cocoa Wine, played a team he had never played before, and their team, uh, Ricky's team, only had eight players, which is fine when you're playing half court, but not when you're playing full court basketball. So, uh, well, um, and so, or five players, excuse me. And so they got about through the first quarter, and the guys were getting worn out running. So the other team, which had uh, 20, about 20 players, uh, uh, one of the guys from their team came and played for Ricky's team. He was really good. Um, he wasn't good at layups. I'll just say that out loud. Uh, but he was good at everything else. He really was a good player. He made several three-pointers. And Anyway, and last week, just, just so you know, just this is me bragging. Last week, Ricky scored 20 uh, in the game that he played, and he had about six assists. So that little, I call him pinball, by the way. Ricky ends up on the floor. If you need your floor clean, just put a basketball in his hand, and he'll fall on it about 400 times. So he does fall and get hit a lot. So anyway, so yesterday they were playing, and Ricky um, threw an awesome pass. This guy was, was over in the corner, and Ricky one arm passed the guy in the corner, and the guy uh, uh, made a, went for a two-pointer, I think, and got fouled. And so... You may not know uh, basketball etiquette, but basketball etiquette is, if, you, if that happens and you go to the free throw, typically whoever gave you the assist, you, you, you give, watch the NBA, you give them a, a thing before they go to the line. Hey, yeah, good job, thanks. So Ricky held out his hand to the guy, and the guy totally didn't see him. Now, now Ricky's in front of, we're on the bleachers. So there's about, I don't know, 100 people in the bleachers. And Ricky does this in the middle of the floor, and the kid doesn't see him, and he turns around and walks away. And Ricky kind of looks at me like, what do I do? I go, Ricky, Ricky, do the hair. Do the hair. Go with that. Right? So, but I want you to know that he got that kind of thing naturally. Because on Friday night, 
I went to Steak and Shake in Merritt Island. And the reason I went to Steak and Shake in Merritt Island is because we had to get some clothes for Lydia. And the only way that I'm going to talk myself into going to the mall is to somehow food has to be involved. Because <laughs> my name, you know, I just, I'm not a big mall person. I, would, I avoid the mall at all costs, and some of you can tell by my clothing. And so, um, you're like, yeah, we noticed. Um, <laughs> It's definitely a belk outfit. But anyway, so, so we're in Steak and Shake, and they, they sat us at the front table, and I'm facing the door, and this couple comes in with a baby, and um, the lady starts waving at me, and, you know, sometimes I know people, you ever know somebody, but you don't know if you know them, and I'm like, she looks a little familiar, maybe I cut her off in traffic, you know, not sure. So I kind of look at her for a minute, and I did the whole tap your chest and go, me? Me? You talking about me? And then the guy came in and he waved too, right at me. So, I thought, well, that's it. Hey! And then they both went. The people behind me are going, hey! Kyle's sitting across from me, and this is the grace that I get in my family. Kyle goes, ha ha ha! That was great! Ah! Now, now, I kind of laughed it off, but I have to say, as much as I normally feel like a dork, which is about a six most of the time, my dork factor went to ten. I felt like I felt like everyone in the whole store was going, oh, you don't even know how to, right? Now, how many of you have ever done that in your life? You've done the accidental, look at that. I see those hands. Look around. Have sympathy for your friends. Tell them, I get you, brother. I get you. I understand. I see your hand. Raise it up and confess to one another your sin. Anyway, so... Um, Sorry, you can tell I was in Baptist church as a kid. Uh, anyway, so um, as I did that, I thought, you know what? We all have moments in our lives when we're discouraged, when we feel dumb. We have moments in our lives where we just want to give up. We want to quit. Most of you know what happened this weekend or this week with Robin Williams. And you think, why? But you have to understand that everybody that we come in contact with, everybody that you know, is fighting some kind of battle. Some of you right now, as you're sitting here, have a hard time paying attention to me because of something that happened to you or something that's coming up or something you're dealing with. And we live not only distracted, but we also live with hurts. Times where not only do people hurt us on accident, but they hurt us on purpose. And so Paul is looking at the early church and he's saying, you know what? Stop being so selfish. Because when somebody falls down in the church, you really have three choices when somebody falls down. And Jesus talked about one. You can ignore them. That's what, remember, the Pharisees did is they went by Jesus. They went, to the other, or they went by the man who had fallen in the ditch. They went on the other side. Or you can go up and you can actually kick them, which is what the, the robbers did. Or you can carry them. So are we going to kick people when they're down or are we going to carry them? I hope and I pray that we're a church that when people fall and when people fail and that when people fall down, that we'll be a church that carries them and not kick them. Most churches are known to kick people when they're down. If you really want to know what churches are like, look at how they treat people, not who do well, Look how they treat people that don't do well. Look how they treat people who fail. Look how they treat people that mess up. Look how they treat the widows. Look how they treat the hurting. One of the amazing things about this church in Josh is so many people, when somebody's really sick, they run away. And you guys have run towards. And that's why people keep coming to me and going, I can't believe your church. And I say, it's all God. Only God can do that. And by the way, it's not my church, just in case you didn't know that. Probably figured that out yet. All right, so here's the first point. Focus on heaven, not status. 1 Corinthians 7, 28 to 31, and a couple of these passages are ones that get pulled out of context sometimes that people will use to say, what in the world's that about? All right, so here we go. But if you marry, you have not sinned. Anybody comforted by that right now? You good? You good? All right. So if you married, you have not sinned, and if a virgin married, she's not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. That's the sentence that I'm going to use in this person's wedding. I'm just going to throw it in there, right in the middle, while I'm doing the first Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind, love is nothing. And another passage says, 
those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And then I'm just going to move on and not say a word about it. Everybody in the audience go, did he just say that about? <laughs> but then Paul continues. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should look, live as if they had none. And some of you are like, well, I've been doing that. What's the deal? <laughs> right? That's not what he means. We're going to talk about what he means in a minute. So just hang on, hang on. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Now what in the world does that mean? What? I should act like I'm not happy? Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if they weren't engrossed. They, they didn't only look at their iPhone all the time. Right? That's what this, that section is talking about. Get that one. And now here's the sentence that ties all this chapter together. For this world in its present form is passing away. You want to change your life? Remember that it's not about your status. It's not about whether you're single or married. You ever met somebody who's single and that's all they ever talk about? You ever met somebody who has lots of stuff and that's all they talk about? You ever met somebody who has nothing and that's all they talk about? They talk about their status all the time. Some people talk about their fancy shirts. Maybe you have a friend that's got a fancy purse and all she ever talks about is her fancy purse. And you're like, oh... And you look at them and you gag me with a spoon. And then they look at you like, what does that mean? Why would you do that? And then you explain the 80s to them and they understand. <laughs> For this world in its present form is passing away. What if we all understood that God's not so concerned about our status, but about our focus? What if we began to, in our marriages, treat our spouse like we understood this all of this life is temporary. What if we treated our stuff like everything is temporary? Most of you know that just recently my car was rear-ended and destroyed. And I got another car and I love the car. And I went out to eat right after and I parked in the parking lot at Makoto's to celebrate. And somebody backed into my new car and messed up the bumper. <laughs> my mom said, it's broken in. I said, I know. It's true. Now I don't have to worry. Somebody slams a card into it. I'm like, there's just another one, right? What if we treated our stuff understanding that there's an eternity? Now here's the thing. The reason Paul said all of these things, there's another place, by the way, where Paul talks about slaves, about being happy where they are. Some people have used that to say that Paul was encouraging slavery. He wasn't. He was just saying, if you're in this state, and actually, Paul, there's a whole uh, uh, book of the Bible written where Paul is encouraging somebody to free a slave, just so you know, if you haven't read that one. But, but Paul's looking at him, he's basically saying, hey, whatever state you're in, if you're stuck at this job, be happy. If you're stuck in this situation where you're single, be happy. If you're mourning, know that it's not all about that. If your life is, life is awesome, don't just sit and focus on how awesome your life is. Focus on the fact that this world in its present form is passing away. And part of the reason theologians think that Paul said this was a couple of reasons. Number one, Paul was good friends uh, uh, with, uh, according to them, with um, several... Um, philosophers of the time. And several of the philosophers, I believe Aristotle also, uh, uh, would say things like it's wrong to marry. Why would you devote your life to marriage if you really want to seek wisdom? You need to devote your life to that. And they talked about marriage being wrong. Well, that had snuck into the church where there was one group of people saying it's wrong to get married and another group of people saying it's wrong not to get married. And they got all caught up in that. But then there came this ruler that began to take over and Paul was very aware of what was going on in Rome, being a Roman citizen. There was this guy, Nero, who had begun taking over, and Paul already had begun to notice how he was treating Christians and what was beginning to happen. And so some scholars believe that Paul, with that in mind, was saying to the early church, hey, this world's passing away. He was trying to help them to have focus on what really mattered, knowing what was coming, the persecution that would take place in the early church. They could see it happening. John Templeton said this, Humility about how little I know has encouraged me to listen more carefully and more wisely. Do you have trouble focusing on eternity? When Paul goes through this chapter and he says, This world is passing away, 
Let me tell you something. They found that during tough times that more songs are written about heaven. Did you know that? During tough times and when uh, the economy's got a downturn, people all of a sudden begin to focus on heaven. Why? Because they realize they don't have the other stuff. Thankfulness will help you to focus on heaven. Thankfulness will help you to focus on what really matters. So take time every day. Listen, you want to change your life? Take time every day when you get up to just thank God. If you're having a bad day, to even thank God. God, I'm having a horrible day, but thank you that I'm still alive. Thank you that I'm still breathing. If you're having trouble breathing, God, thank you that I can breathe a little. If you can't breathe at all, okay, just call 911. But other than that, give thanks. Take time to give thanks. It'll change your life. So I want you to do something before we go any further. You don't have to do it out loud. I'm not going to do an out loud one. But I want you to just, in your head, think of three things that you're thankful for. You don't have to say them out loud. Just go ahead. Think of them. I'll be here if you need me. Anyone need help with thinking of three things? No, it's easy to think of three things, isn't it? And if you have trouble, just go through the alphabet. Lord, thanks for apples and bananas and carrots. Right there. you got fruits. and I don't like any of them, but there you go. All right. So the second point is this. Consider the feelings of others. Consider the feelings of others. They did a study, and I just saw it this week. They did a study of Americans, and here's what they discovered. 50% of Americans do not know the names of their next door neighbors. Did you know that? That should scare you a little bit. Because the government knows the names of all your neighbors. And you don't. So maybe you should. Maybe you should go out of your way to meet them. To find out their names. Just to go over today, knock on the door and say, what's your name? Write it down and walk away. And they'll freak out and call the police on you. We live in a world that years ago we used to borrow sugar or a lawnmower or something from a neighbor. Now we all have our own stuff and we cocoon and we do our own thing. Well, in the early church, they became insensitive to new believers. And so I'm going to take this passage and explain it to you a little bit so just so you can understand how this passage... And by the way, here's something you do with Scripture. Sometimes there's a Scripture that you don't get, okay? So what you want to do is find out the context. What was happening in that time... And then take the principle. What was the principle Paul was trying to get here? And then apply it to your life. So I'm going to help you with one. But this principle from this passage I have used over and over and over. Now, I like to grill. Men, do you like to grill? Are there any men here that like to grill? Yeah, now I want to, now, I want to hear a manly sound when you say okay. So give me a manly sound if you like to grill. Go ahead. All right. So I like to grill, and um, a few weeks ago, my sister was over with her 10 children, and so we had 17 people at the house, so I went and bought uh, those cheap uh, bubble burgers that you get, you know, in the package, and I threw them on the grill, and I walked inside, and I said to my nephew, hey, just keep an eye on it, and when I walked back out, the flames were shooting up, and my nephew said, cool, that's awesome, you know, and I'm like, no, it's not, it wasn't really what I meant by keep an eye on it, but that's all right, and there was smoke and flames, I will say, it is pretty awesome when the flames are, and I'm, you know, and it's good because it kind of exfoliates. And uh, anyway, so, so you're out there, right? You heat up the grill and you like to scrub it off and get it ready and flip the burgers and do all that stuff. And you go in and if you're like a super cook, you go in maybe to Publix and you go through the meat and you're like, well, I don't want that because that's, and maybe you're one of those nuts that goes and actually gets like steak and then says to the guy in the back, hey, can you grind this up for me and make it into this? And you tell him all kind of things and he does whatever he wants anyway, but you pretend that he did what you wanted and you thank him. Maybe you're one of those crazy people. I'm one of these people who just buy the box and throw them on, so don't come eat hamburgers in my house. Probably like but anyway, so I got the hamburgers and I'm cooking them. Now, let me tell you what was happening in their time that Paul's getting ready to talk about to this church. When they would go to pu the Publix of Corinth, I don't know what it was called. Got a good name? Agape store, maybe, or something? Okay. So they would go into the Agape grocery store, and as they went into the Agape grocery store, they would get in there, and there would be a meat section. And they'd have a whole section called Bale Burgers, or in their case, Aphrodite Burgers. Okay? And they would get these hamburgers and take them home. Now, I don't know if they had a grill, so we'll just pretend that they did. They probably didn't. You know, and I don't think natural gas was out yet. We're working on you know. Anyway, so you know, and so the guy's out in the backyard with his friend. Now, 
This Christian has just led this former Baal worshiper to Christ. Just a week ago, this guy was going into the temple and he was doing things that would make people in Amsterdam go, you did what? People in Las Vegas are going, no, right? And, and just a week ago, he was doing this stuff and now he comes to Christ. He wants to learn how to live the Christian life. He was, at the time he was in the temple, he was eating Baal burgers, meat sacrificed to idol. They told him that that meat, because it was sacrificed to idols, when you eat it, you actually get part of the, the, uh, the idol. You actually get part of Aphrodite, or you get part of Baal. And so, you know, this stuff was filling you up, and they talked about spirits and all this stuff. So he comes over to this Christian house, and he looks, and I don't know if they marked it with Baal burger. You know, I don't know how he knew, but he looks, and he sees Baal burgers, and he says to the Christian, wait a second, I thought you were a Christian. Do we still worship Baal? I mean, if you eat that meat, you're going to get some demons in you and stuff, don't you know? Now, Paul basically looks at the early Christians and he says, listen, now you could sit and explain this whole thing to them. Or you could just not eat bale burgers in front of them. So let me read the passage and then we'll go back to this again. Now about food sacrificed to idols. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. By the way, that's a great verse. Knowledge puffs up, puffs up. Love builds up. The word for knowledge is one of my favorites to say. It's gnosko. That's just fun to say. So just say that for fun. Gnosko. See, you said Greek today. So if anybody says, we learn Greek in church. And then they'll say, that's dumb. And you say, yes, it is. Okay. Anyway, so knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The idea of build up is a house builder, somebody who builds a house. So what Paul was saying is, you know a bunch of stuff, but you've become insensitive to other people because you know stuff, but you're cooking those hamburgers and you're not thinking about your friend. So he continues, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. I love that because I know people like that. He's talking here about know-it-alls. People who think they know something, but you get to know them. And you realize they don't know anything. You ever met somebody who seems to have an answer for anything? You start to call them Wikipedia. You're like, dude, you're like Wikipedia. They think they know everything. And after you hang out with them a while, you realize they're just making it up. They're like that grandfather that you could ask about anything. And he'd say, well, I actually think that was back when, you know, they just start making stuff up. By the way, guys, we are notorious for making up answers when we really don't know what something is. And wives, if you want to see, or girls, if you want to see what this is like, just ask a man something that really doesn't have an answer and watch how he answers it. It's, it's a riot to watch. I actually go to parties and enjoy watching people do this when you talk about, you know, so why does the smoke go so high? And they'll make up a reason. Well, you know, the fat count and those burgers, blah, blah, blah. They have no idea. They're just, they're just making a guess. It's good. So that's what it talks about here. The man who thinks he knows something he does not yet to know, excuse me, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. Basically, better to know less but have God know you than the other way around. So, this is what I say about eating meat sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol really is nothing in this world, and we know there really is only one God, even though there are things called gods in heaven and on earth. For us, there is only one God, our Father. All things came from Him, and we live for Him, and there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. All things were made through Him, and we were also made through Him. By the way, this is part of the Trinity thing, and I don't have time to go into that today, but it's pretty awesome. But not all people know this. Some people are still so used to idols that when, they, when you give them a bale burger, they still think of it as being sacrificed to an idol because their conscience is weak. When they eat it, they feel guilty, but food, I hate this sentence, food will not bring us closer to God. I don't know. I've eaten some steaks that I felt really close to God after I ate. I mean, you bite into a good steak and all of a sudden you hear angels. But I understand what Paul means. He's basically talking about, they think that it's demon possessed. They think that somehow they're taking in a demon when they eat. Okay, so he says that the food won't bring you closer to God. Refusing to eat doesn't make us less pleasing to God, and eating does not make us better in God's sight. Do you know the difference between a big issue and a small issue? 
A big issue is when it affects you. A small issue is when it affects anybody else. A big issue is when it, something that affects you in some way is suddenly a big issue, but to other people that it doesn't affect, it's like, that's not a big issue. Haven't you ever seen somebody freaking out and you think, what are they freaking out about? Paul's saying this to the early church. He's like, I know it's not a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to them. So be sensitive to them. Years ago, um, the, the women from the Southern Baptist Convention were going to Germany to visit the German Southern Baptist Convention in that area. And so what the women found out is they found out that the German Baptist drank wine with dinner. Well, the American Baptists didn't drink wine with dinner. The second thing they found out, which last night I found out the women cared more about this one, is that the German women felt it was wrong to wear makeup. Yeah. So here's what happened. When the Americans went over to Germany, they decided we're going to bring a bottle of wine for dinner and we are not going to wear makeup. So the women showed up at the banquet. These women showed up with no makeup and a bottle of wine. Across from them, on the table, there were no wine glasses, and the German women had put on makeup. Now, what happened in that situation? They had preferred one another to the point that it was kind of funny because they all realized that they had all gone out of their way, but so much better to do that. Now, do we really consider others when we're going through life? Do we consider their conscience, what hurts them, how we're leading them down the wrong path? So often I see Christians fighting on Facebook over things that probably ought to not be fought out in public. I'm getting ready to teach seminary on Genesis, the book of Genesis. And in Genesis there's some things where people have very strong beliefs. And I'm going to encourage my students, I want you to stand strong on what you believe. It's okay. You can stand really strong on what you believe, but here's what I want to teach them. I'm going to be teaching them for eight weeks, and here's my number one plan for this class. To learn how to stand strong for what you believe without being a jerk. Did you know you can have an opinion without being a jerk? Now, most of us don't know that because if you watch the news, if you watch talk or listen to talk radio, if you even watch ESPN, people have opinions and they say it like jerks. Stephen A. Smith is well known for being a jerk. He's proud of it. But you know what? You don't have to be a jerk to stand for what you believe in. Paul's looking at the early church and he's saying to them, be sensitive to other people. You will find as you look back upon your life that the moments when you have truly lived are the moments when you've done things in the spirit of love. That's the same thing I want you to pray. Pray that God would make you sensitive. God, would you make me sensitive to my neighbors? Would you make me sensitive to that new Christian? God, make me sensitive, like I talked about last week, to that person in my life that's not a Christian, to that waiter or that waitress or that person who I work with. Number three, prefer others over yourself. You ever stub your toe? Isn't it amazing how in the middle of the night that little pinky toe can find the corner of your bed, no problem? Right? When you stub your toe, all you care about is that toe for just a minute, right? Paul's talking to the early church and he says, you know, it may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to the others. So here's what he says. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you with this knowledge eating in God, idols' temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what's been sacrificed to idols? So the weaker brother for whom Christ just died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brother in this way and wound their conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. So that will not cause him to fall. In today's world, a lot of times we have friends who are alcoholics or struggle with alcoholism. When they come to your house, please don't give them wine for dinner. That's the practical application of this passage. It's be sensitive to people who are struggling. One of the reasons that in our church when we take the Lord's Supper, we don't use wine is because we know that there's people who struggle and just the taste of that for them brings back, hey! And so we'd rather go out of our way to do that. Years ago there was a guy in, 19, in 1888. This guy woke up. He was in France at the time. And he woke up and his obituary was in the paper. 
This guy's name was Alfred. And as he read his obituary, it was titled, The Merchant of Death Has Died. And as he read his own obituary, it talked about how many people died because of one of his inventions. And that's all it talked about, all the deaths he had caused, all the people that passed away. It didn't talk about his achievements. It didn't talk about anything else. But because he had invented dynamite, all it talked about is all the people that had died. After that guy read that, by the way, it was actually his brother who had passed away. After he read those reports, he decided that he then was going to make a difference. And so he decided to change his will. He had a huge fortune. I mean, inventing dynamite at the time was huge. It was so much safer than what they had been doing before. Still deadly, but much safer than what they were doing with nitroglycerin and everything. So he decided he was going to change his life. And what he did is when he died, he left 94% of his huge fortune to give an award to people who benefited mankind in physics, chemistry, peace, philosophy, or medicine, and literature. That man's name was Alfred Nobel. And most of you know and have heard of the Nobel Peace Prize. The reason the Nobel Peace Prize came around is because one man woke up one morning and said, you know what? I don't want to just live for me. I want to go out of my way to be a blessing to other people. You know what? God can do the same thing with you. It doesn't require a lot of money. Isn't that good news? <laughs> it doesn't even require a lot of time. But it requires you and I going out of our way to say, God, would you make me sensitive to others? God, would you help me to be considerate of the feelings of others? And God, would you help me to prefer others over myself? When there's a choice of helping somebody out or doing something, help me to go out of my way to prefer them, to go out of my way for people. If you do that, you won't be going to heaven alone. Because as you do that and you go out into your neighborhood, as you reach out to your neighbors, there will be other people who will say there's something different about them. And they may just come to Christ and know him for eternity. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, we don't do a formal invitation where people come down the aisles, but after the service I'll be here and I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to say, Jesus, I want to give you my life. Maybe you're here this morning, you've given your life to Christ, but you've never been baptized as a believer. Maybe you were baptized as a baby before you were saved, or maybe you were baptized as a child, but the truth is, you've never given your life to Christ. I encourage you, in a few weeks, we're going to have a time of baptism. Sign up for baptism and say, I want to take that next step with God. And as you begin to take those steps, and you begin to love the people around you, God will use you to make a difference in others. Let's not live a selfish life. Let's go out of our way to be a blessing to the people around us and to change their lives too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for each one here. I thank you for a church that I can go other places in the county and people say, I've heard of your church. I've heard of what God's doing there. I've heard of how you reach out and you love people. And Father, I'm thankful for that, but we never want to become arrogant about that. Because Father, we know all good things come from you and we're thankful for that. Father, I know this morning it's easy for some of us to remember our selfishness and the things that happen. So Lord, we confess that to you. There are times where we only think of ourselves, so we ask for your...